Uh, my name is James Crabtree. I'm the executive director of IISS Asia. Thanks very much for, for coming. I know that uh, it's often difficult at the Shangri-La Dialogue to prize yourself away from the initial round of networking, but we're uh, very happy to have you here to launch a new uh, research product, um, uh, the Myanmar Conflict Map, uh, which uh, our three speakers um, and others in our team have been working on uh, over the last year. Uh, I, I mean, you will be able to go to another session on the conflict in Myanmar uh, tomorrow, which Aaron will chair, where we will have a number of those involved in the diplomacy around the, the conflict talking about a path forward. But given the IISS, in addition to being a convener, um, is a research institute uh, under Aaron's Southeast Asia program in our office here at IISS Asia, we've been undertaking a range of different work uh, to try and see if we can help uh, provide facts and evidence that might uh, help the participants in the Myanmar um, conflict and its associated diplomacy move forward. So what we're going to do uh, first uh, is, I think I, we're going to turn to Aaron first, um, and Aaron is going to give a little uh, uh, introduction, and Aaron and Shona Long have been the, 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 the intellectual um, drivers behind the Myanmar conflict map. And to their, their left um, is Brody Smith, who is the, the data genius uh, behind what you're about to see. Um, and so uh, Brody uh, um, is, so Shona is based in Zurich, and Brody is based in Australia, but they both came here to show you what we've been working on, which is the, the start of a new process in which we're trying to bring together um, both analysis, but also um, uh, innovative data visualization and cartographic research uh, that we hope will help people understand exactly what's been happening in Myanmar and then um, help chart a path forward. So I'm really excited about this. I want to congratulate the three of them for the work that they've done. Aaron, over to you. Thank you, James. And I might just encourage some of you who are uh, new to this AV system to put in your, your name card into the right-hand side of the AV system so that your name shows up so that we know who you are when you... Uh, if you want to, to make an intervention or speak. Um, your neighbor who has figured it out might be able to show you how it works. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. The Myanmar Conflict Map is a new tool for tracking, visualizing, and analyzing reports of violence in Myanmar. The, this IISS analysis, which we will present today, and which you will see on the map, builds on a database of over 10,000 reports of violence in Myanmar over the last two years as collected by our colleagues at the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, better known as ACLED. The map pulls out of the data specific conflict dynamics and isolates a set of six separate warscapes, which we hope will give users a framework for understanding the nature and direction of what may seem like indistinct violence from afar. My partners in this effort, Shona Lung and Brody Smith, are seated beside me. Shona is the author of a series of six written analyses, zooming in on specific theaters or warscapes in the map. And Brody has been an integral part of the team designing and programming the map and analysis pages, which you will see on our site when the map is released following this meeting. Before we begin, though, let me first say a few words about the state of the conflict in Myanmar since the February 2021 coup d'etat. Myanmar is no stranger to armed conflict. Since the country's independence, no central government has fully controlled the country's peripheries, where a range of armed ethno-nationalist movements have fought for autonomy for decades. But the breadth and depth of the crisis today is unprecedented. For the first time, over a million people in Myanmar are internally displaced. The World Bank estimates that the economy shrank by a fifth in 2021, and it is not growing this year. Food insecurity affects a quarter of the population. And as Shona will discuss later, in some regions, the demands of insurgency and counterinsurgency leave civilians with difficult choices between violence and nonviolence, between principles and self-preservation on a daily basis. This is the situation today because on the 1st of February, 2021, Senior General Min Aung Hlaing seized power in Myanmar. The State Administration Council junta that he leads immediately faced nonviolent resistance on a scale not seen in decades. Much of the civil service went on strike as part of the nationwide civil disobedience movement crippling basic functions of the state. Street protests attracted tens of thousands, most of them young people who had come of age during 10 years of liberalization beginning in 2011. When the Tomara, as the Myanmar Armed Forces call themselves, 
suppressed the protests through crackdowns which cost thousands of lives, opponents of the coup turned to violent resistance. We can classify actors in the conflict into three groups. SAC forces, anti-SAC forces, and ethnic armed organizations. SAC forces refer to the Tomadaw and its known allies, most notably the Pusati. The Pusati are groups of pro-SAC civilians who have received weapons and daily wages from the junta in exchange for reinforcing Tomadaw attacks. Anti-SAC forces are those primarily interested in toppling the military regime formed after the 2021 coup. The most prominent set of actors here are the People's Defense Forces, or PDFs. PDFs are small cells of people who oppose the coup using arms, who have organized on a local basis, using violence against regime soldiers, military-linked infrastructure, and purported supporters of the regime. Although Myanmar's shadow government, the National Unity Government, or NUG, seeks to bring PDFs under a unified chain of command, in reality, PDFs have varied and loose relationships with the NUG. Third, we have ethnic armed organizations, or EAOs. These are armed groups which claim to represent non-Bamar ethnicities. They all predate the coup, often by decades, and often control territory close to Myanmar's borders with Thailand, China, and Bangladesh, where they, both, where they run administrative and political institutions for populations that have had little contact with previous central governments. To date, no EAOs have fought PDFs. The responses to the coup have varied. Some EAOs have been vociferous opponents, others have equivocated, and a few have recently acquiesced to the SAC. What all the EAOs share is that they are faced with a moving map of new actors, alliances, and front lines. In particular, the EAOs have taken the emergence of PDFs into consideration in calculating whether to capitalize on a new appetite for armed resistance among the wider population or to focus on securing autonomy for the ethnic groups they represent. Besides this, the conflict map shows the spatial distribution of violent events unclaimed by any actor. There have been approximately 3,000 incidents of unattributed violence, predominantly explosions, since the coup, encompassing 22% of all violent events. I'll turn it over now to Shona, who will discuss uh, the warscapes. Thank you, Aaron. The conflict map shows that since the coup, armed violence has occurred in 94% of Myanmar's townships. But while the war is widespread, it is also uneven. This is because the ongoing conflict is layered over older struggles that predate the coup, primarily the dynamics between EAOs and the Tatmadaw in various ethnic areas. Our conflict map and accompanying commentary series provide a deep dive into six warscapes. The Dry Zone, Rakhine, Northeast Myanmar, Southeast Myanmar, Northwest Myanmar, and Lower Myanmar, and conflict dynamics in each. A brief analysis of the dry zone warscape demonstrates what our conflict map and commentary series does and does not do. Since the coup, the dry zone has been racked by conflict between the SAC and the Pusoti on one hand and anti-SAC PDS on the other. EAOs are not significant actors in this warscape. The dry zone is pivotal to the countrywide conflict for two reasons. Firstly, the Dry Zone's inhabitants have not witnessed widespread armed violence since Myanmar's independence. The violence that characterizes the area has taken an extraordinary toll on the civilian population. Secondly, the Dry Zone is known as the heartland of Burma Buddhism. Its rural Burma Buddhist population was pivotal to the Tatmadaw's claims to preserve Burmese nationhood. With the Tatmadaw fighting against this population, now organized as PDFs, the conflict in the dry zone is unsettling the foundations of the Myanmar nation state. We explore these states in our dry zone commentary, which analyzes the Tatmadaw's systematic raising of houses suspected to shelter regime opponents. This counterinsurgency tactic became widespread from April 2022 onwards. This is evident in our map, which shows the high incidence of infrastructure destruction in Sagaing, Mandalay, and Magwe compared to other areas. The raising of houses indicates the extent to which the ongoing conflict is undoing the line between civilian and combatant. Civilian combatant distinctions began to blur in the dry zone in May 2021, when civilians took up arms to join PDFs and the Pusoti and attacked those suspected of links with the opposing side. But the Tatmadaw's scorched earth policy has accelerated this process 
and made it irreversible since the tactic targets communities and not individuals for abetting the resistance. By June this year, the UNHCR reported that an estimated 337,000 people had been displaced in Sagaing alone. The SAC scorched earth policy is also significant because it was used punitively against EAOs between the 1980s and 2000s when they refused to accede to Tatmadaw demands. Before the coup, the Tatmadaw explained these counterinsurgency tactics by citing a need to preserve Myanmar's national unity against factious elements, namely the most belligerent EAOs. The conflict map now shows that the SAC is using similar tactics against the dry zone's Burma Buddhist population. This illuminates the relationship between the SAC and the Myanmar nation state, revealing the SAC to be a class that stands apart from the rest of the population, willing to preserve its grip on power at the expense of the country's core. This brief overview of the dry zone demonstrates the potential of analysis done through the conflict map, which draws attention to conflict dynamics in each warscape in terms of types of violence, actors involved, and change over time. Media reports already attest to attacks, explosions, and arson in the dry zone, but the conflict map better illustrates their spatial and temporal extent. The accompanying commentary series then interprets the map through the lens of what we know about Myanmar's politics and history. We do the same for five other warscapes. Rakhine, for instance, has been a curious exception to the violence occurring countrywide. Before the coup, Rakhine's inhabitants witnessed an intensity of violence not seen in EAO areas since the 1990s. But ahead of the November 2020 elections, violence ebbed away because of an informal ceasefire between the Arakan Army, or AA, and the Tatmadaw. In the past year, the AA has leveraged the coup to expand its administrative structures across large parts of the Rakhine countryside. It now claims control of over two-thirds of Rakhine state. The AA's dominance in the area has created tensions with the Tatmadaw, as evident in a smattering of clashes in AA strongholds since November last year. Our accompanying commentary explores these dynamics further between the AA, the SAC, and the anti-SAC resistance amidst these rising tensions. Conversely, in Southeast Myanmar, violence has flared up since the coup. The Southeast is notable and distinctive because of the close relationship between local EAOs and the NUG. EAOs in the Southeast are optimistic about the NUG. They hope that the NUG will accommodate their long-held desires for self-determination under a federal system. But there are doubts about how long an alliance built on the assumption of NUG victory can last, when that victory is not yet in sight. These are the kinds of questions the conflict map helps us to answer. In doing so, the map clarifies what might look like indistinct violence from afar. I'd like to conclude with some general reflections on or what taking apart these warscapes, then putting them back together, can tell us about Myanmar. The conflict map divides actors into four groups, SAC, anti-SAC, EAOs, and unattributed actors. The conflict is not a binary contest between SAC and anti-SAC forces. Keeping the varied aspirations and challenges faced by these actors in mind allows for a clearer assessment of conflict in Myanmar. Moreover, as Aaron mentioned, the conflict map deliberately makes visible the existence of 3,000 unattributed violent events. The scale of unattributed violence is a reminder that the conflict in Myanmar is a struggle over information as much as a struggle over territory, resources, and rights. By displaying changes in the types of violent events over time, the conflict map also tracks the evolution of conflict in Myanmar. This makes clear that at present, Neither the SAC nor its opponents can claim to be winning this war. Since October 2021, Myanmar has witnessed above 900 violent events each month, predominantly armed clashes and remote explosions. The data shows a war of attrition. Nonetheless, tracking the conflict also reminds us that things can change. There is likely to be a lull in conflict in the wet season in 2022, as there was last year, during which time actors will regroup and re-strategize hoping to break the impasse. Whatever happens will be reflected in the conflict map as we update it in coming months. We will also release more commentaries on specific issues that crop up. 
Finally, in making the conflict map, we resisted the urge to map areas of control, focusing instead on where violence occurred. In our opinion, a map of territorial gains would be misleading and inaccurate. For one, due to threats facing journalists and their sources, reports of shifts in control can be unreliable. Furthermore, the concept of territorial control does not reflect the nature of conflict in Myanmar at present. No one actor controls many parts of the dry zone. The AA in Rakhine cedes major cities and roads to the Tatmadaw. Moreover, by mapping violence, not control, the conflict map draws attention to how violence affects civilians and the social dynamics they are embedded in, rather than presume stability in any given area. We hope that you find the map useful and insightful. Thank you for coming today. Very good. Um, so we were, we now have an open period for questions and discussions, um, either about the, the map itself, but, but I would suggest probably it may be more productive to use our time to uh, take points from the floor or questions for the authors about the state of the conflict in Myanmar and the diplomacy surrounding it. I would say just, just a couple of things from our point of view as the institute. Firstly, this is a reasonably new kind of analysis um, uh, for our office here in Asia, but the institute as a whole um, has long uh, um, put a lot of stead in the development both of original data, but also um, cartographic data and visualization. You'll see that in our military balance work and also our annual armed conflict survey. And so in a sense, this fits in um, a tradition of work that we do um, in the Institute. Uh, the second, I, I would say, or maybe the, the final thing I would say is, uh, Aaron, do you want to tell people when they can have a play with the map and how they might, uh, how they might do that? Because this is an interactive tool. Um, and, and so I suspect probably what you might want to do is look at Aaron's Twitter feed after this and he might put it on Twitter and then you can find the links. Yeah, you can go to miama.iiss.org. It's a fairly simple uh, address and, uh, and you can load the map and explore the data on your own and also read Shona's first analysis uh, as well as our methodology. Very good. That being said, um, who would like to either make a, a point from the floor uh, or ask a question, uh, if you might introduce yourself and, and where you're from um, so that everyone in the room would know. So let me go, sir, to you first. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nia. I'm, uh, I'm from Myanmar. Right now I'm at uh, Cornell University as a, a researcher. Uh, I have two questions actually for the, uh, for the, for the panelists. Uh, one is about the data collection. And the, another one, uh, the other one is about the, how we can use uh, that uh, the, the data set. So, I mean, like in other countries, like in every conflict uh, uh, zone, you know, when, when, you, when we are collecting the data in the, on the ground situation, in the conflict area, usually the data is not complete. In Myanmar or in Ukraine, especially in the Myanmar, you can see the both side, both the military and also the NUG PDF side. They are, they are making a lot of propaganda on social media, you know, you don't have a local a journalist on the ground, you don't have an international journalist on the ground, how can we verify um, the, the, the data that we got? So my first question is that, could you please elaborate more on the data collection uh, methods? Do you have any local stats from Myanmar who can speak Amish language, who can track on the uh, Myanmar news website, you know, that kind of uh, uh, things? Uh, have you also consulted with the PR reviewer who really understand about Myanmar? Uh, that, that is uh, the first part. And the second part is the, uh, how, how can we use uh, this data set? Can we make like a prediction for the current, the future or kind of the, this conflict? You know, what, what would be the uh, predicate implication for our own research? Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Let me take two questions to start. Um, so I, I saw your, your hand, yes, yeah. Thank you, James. Mo here, Mo Duza, co-coordinator of the Myanmar Studies Program at the ICS Yusuf Ishaq Institute. Good afternoon. Um, first off, I'd just like to say thank you for this briefing and congratulations um, uh, to Aaron team, particularly Shona and Brody, for this, this very informative and uh, I think also insightful visualization based on uh, data that I think all of us uh, who are watching, monitoring developments in Myanmar since February the 1st, 2021, uh, usually run to, uh, for example, making sense of the ACLAT data, for example. I think I particularly found useful that um, the, the graphics that show clearly how the incidence of 
violent acts just, just shot up after February, February 2021, and also the nature of those conflicts where um, I, I think prior to the coup, it was mainly those kinds of armed clashes um, uh, and the operations uh, take, taken by the Myanmar military towards or against ethnic armed organizations, whereas the nature of uh, the conflict and the clashes, as we all know, um, changed very much um, and took on a much darker, uh, I think, aspect after February the 1st. Um, so so I'll, I'll look to playing around with the graphics and the, the visualization a bit more, but I think it's very important that, that um, the, the areas of conflict, as you have shown and contextualized uh, in Myanmar today, um, it, it's important because um, it's complex. And, and I think that contextualization of what's happening in the dry zone, the significance of the dry zone, where the Arakan army and the whole uh, unique dilemma and position of Rakhine lies in all of this, plus the more historical, traditional mindsets of ethnic armed groups that have really asserted their, uh, you know, their, their objectives since, um, since before the 1962 coup, probably uh, also uh, giving reason for um, later pronouncements by the military to privilege its role and a position in Myanmar's political landscape. I think those are important. And I'll look forward to reading more of Shona's analyses as we go on. Um, two points that I'd like to add to uh, what's already a very rich uh, discussion and presentation. Um, I'm not sure where the contextualization of conflict can fully capture the motivations of people on the ground. I mean, yes, we can see when we look at, yes, the anti-SAC um, interventions, actions, and so on. And we can guess at what fuels it. But um, an important part of contextualizing what's going on in Myanmar since February last year really is what is fueling this, this very real anger that we're seeing in the form of all those dots that represent the anti-SAC um, acts and interventions. And, and perhaps that may help all of us uh, get a glimpse into um, how all those mindsets can actually um, change or somehow through some form of miraculous mediation uh, be brought to consider talks about the talks because as we all know uh, right now, attitudes are very polarized. And the, uh, and the SAC's scorched earth policy is definitely not um, not ending any of these uh, flames fueling the anger and the response from people who, yes, who probably just, you know, just wanted to eke out their existence in peace. And, and so that's one point about the motivations of what's fueling the sentiments um, probably needs to be contextualized more in all our analyses. And uh, the other thing that's uh, becoming quite clear from this is also precedent matters very much. Shona talked about the SAC scorched earth policy. Actually, that's the military's uh, policy, and they fall back on precedent. Um, and they're falling back on precedent again, even though times have changed and sentiments have definitely changed in this part of the 21st century. But it's not just the SAC. Precedent is also something that the anti-SAC forces probably are falling back on, way back to even when uh, people were trying to push back against British colonization. Is that kind of sentiment and precedent. And um, so those of us uh, sitting around the table wanting to see how regional interna international interventions could um, have some impact, I think we also need to probably look at what precedents we're looking at when we want to try our best to find a constructive outcome for Myanmar. I'm sorry to have taken too much time, but no. talking about Myanmar always brings out a passionate side in me. Thank you for the patience. Thank you. For those of you who don't know Moho, work at, the, at ISIS is um, uh, best, in the, best in the business. So um, Shona, do you want to pick up a couple of those points? I think the point Mo raised at the end is one we might come back to about the regional diplomacy, but, but maybe you could take on some of the specifics from those two uh, interventions. Thank you for the questions, Nian and Mo. Um, firstly, I guess um, I would like to address Nian's point about methodology. I can tell you a bit more about the data that we use and why we chose to do it this way. Um, so as Aaron mentioned earlier, our map relies on the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, better known as ACLET. We were drawn to ACLET's um, database for a few reasons. The first one was that um, ACLET does hire Burmese researchers 
And also we looked at the sources that they were using, which included not only Burmese sources, but also, also ethnic media in Myanmar. And we felt that would be quite important um, in the current context to be able to capture the, um, the full extent of the conflict um, going on. Arclad is also unique among conflict databases in that it records events in which there are no fatalities. And we find that to be also very interesting and important in the Myanmar context, where the destruction of infrastructure is an incredibly important part of conflict dynamics. Finally, ArcLert updates its data weekly, allowing us again up-to-date snapshot of the conflict. And as we mentioned, we'll continue to, up, um, to update this map in coming weeks and months uh, so that we can see how the conflict in Myanmar evolves. That said, on our part, the IISS team combed through ArcLert's data and adapted it to the Myanmar context. For instance, this involved reframing actors and events. So if you look at the map now, you can see that there are five event types. Attacks, armed clashes, remote explosives and IEDs, air and drone strikes, crackdowns, and infrastructure destruction. These are not ArcLeds, the categories through which ArcLed categorizes its data. It's what we have chosen to do with the data that it has provided. And we did this in order to A, contextualize the data and make it make sense to an audience that would also be engaging in other debates about Myanmar, and B, to recognize the asymmetrical nature of conflict in Myanmar today. The best example I can give for this is the category crackdown. Um, which I think people familiar with Myanmar will know that that's a very common word that has been you know, used to describe what is happening um, when uh, the SAC targets protesters in Myanmar today. In the ArcLet um, database, it uses various um, event subtypes um, to discuss kind of instances where protests are met with violent interventions. So for instance, there's a subtype, protest with intervention, violent demonstration, mob violence, and excessive force with protesters. We found by combing through all this data that in the Myanmar context, they refer to something quite specific, which is the SAC's attacks on protesters. And therefore, we chose to combine it into a single event type uh, to make the map, I suppose, legible to people who are familiar with the Myanmar context. I also appreciate um, your comment about how difficult it is to do conflict reporting, and that is something that we always had in mind in this process. I will say firstly that this is the best possible map that we can come up with at this time. There are many instances of unreported violence that we are not able to address here. But what we did also choose to do is to include an unattributed actors tab, which recognizes difficulties in reporting on conflict in Myanmar. There are approximately 3,000 events unclaimed by any actor, which we chose to present on the map, as it is a significant um, proportion of all violence in Myanmar today, accounting for 22% of violent events. Thirdly, there are also forms of violence that we realize do not lend themselves to cartographic um, expression. And one form of violence that has been significant in Myanmar is sexual violence. And we knew that that was highly underreported in the data. And so we made the deliberate decision to discuss this in the commentary series, but not in the map, as we felt that this would give an accurately low perception of um, how much that form of violence occurs. So uh, you can also read a bit more about our methodology uh, on the methodology section of our page. But thank you so much for the question. You also mentioned how to use the data, and that is something that I think I would like to leave to people who use the map. Really what we hope to offer is a framework for understanding conflict. Uh, having followed the media um, on Myanmar and, and various discussions, it can often seem very indistinct and chaotic. And we really wanted to give people a framework for understanding this, but for them to kind of take this off um, on their own and to use it as a starting point for deeper analysis. Um, Mo, as well, thank you so much for the questions and the kind comments. Uh, I think your comments are very well taken. I think the first one was about whether or not uh, a map like this can accurately capture motivations for engaging in violence. And the short answer, I suppose, is that it cannot. <laughs> and that is something that we were also very aware of. I will say, however, I think we also made a very deliberate choice in trying to combine qualitative analysis uh, with this map, and that's why we chose to do, in a way, this two-track research product of commentary plus, um, plus cartography. Um, we hope that that will address a little bit more of motivations. But that said, that also poses a, deep, a further question about the impossibility of doing kind of rounded qualitative research in the current context in Myanmar. Uh, and that's also something that we're very aware of, you know, what can we know and what can we not know, and how can we write about that? As far as possible, when it comes to the dry zone, we try and acknowledge the existential stakes of the conflict. We understand that that is very much the case, uh, given what we know. But I have the same questions as you. There's a lot more that I would like to know about motivations, as well as what you said about 
uh, precedents for violence, not just uh, in regards to the SEC and the Tatmadaw, but in terms of the resistance? And to what extent are they drawing from um, older instances of resistance and violence um, in the country? Thank you. Let's take a couple more points. Melanie Chu, I saw you had your hand up, and, and Ian Chong, uh, so Melanie. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, it, uh, I applaud and praise this project. Well done to IISS uh, for uh, uh, combining technology and uh, evidence in this uh, really um, unique way. Uh, I, I see this as really the, uh, a draft, a template uh, which scholars of other persuasions, uh, the, the historians, uh, the uh, political scientists, the uh, ethnographists can all add um, a little bit like a Google map. You know, you can add uh, various layers, uh, layer on layer, uh, uh, from the basic um, map to include the terrain, the history, the um, precedents, the the, the political, uh, political scientists' uh, rendering of the map, and it will be very, very rich and very valuable, I see. Um, uh, I just wanted to know, I suppose from the point of view of someone concerned about infrastructure of study, is what resources are you using? What, what does it take to produce this map? What resources? Uh, are required, and um, in light of the request for more detail and more layering of the map, what resources would it uh, would be required to improve or perfect upon this template, very useful template that you have created? Thank you, Melanie. It's a great question. Um, Ian Chong. Um, and I might take one, one more question as well, just in, in this round, but Ian from NUS. Thanks, James. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation, um, uh, Aaron and Shona. Shona, good to see you again. Um, so my question is, you've looked at all kinds of different kinds of conflict uh, in Myanmar. I'm wondering if any patterns uh, strike out. You know, when do certain kinds of conflict appear more? Uh, when do they appear less? When are things more violent? Uh, does it track with time? Does it track with certain other kinds of events? Um, the, when are certain actors more or less violent? Um, so I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get a sense right, from your data as to you know, how much we can extrapolate. Thanks. And just to show that we have absolutely no uh, favorites for those around the table, uh, let me turn over here to the right. Hi, uh, this is Sui Li Wee from the New York Times. I wanted to ask about China. Um, China has clearly shown that it wants to step up its relationship with the junta. How much uh, of this do you think can change the trajectory of the situation there? Thank you. OK, um, let's go in reverse order. So uh, Aaron, do you want to take the China question? And maybe Shona, you can take the, the sort of methodology in future. So I think. Um, China is playing a subtle game with regard to Myanmar since the coup. Uh, China had a very good relationship with the Aung San Suu Kyi government and was disappointed to see that relationship disrupted. And it's been, it's been certainly been complicated by the coup. At the same time, uh, Myanmar is now in a position where it needs friends, and there are very few friends to which it can turn. And while Min Aung Lai himself is no fan of Beijing, um, he earned his reputation fighting the MNDAA, uh, ethnic armed organization, on the border with China. Um, and he has said publicly that he believes that China is arming uh, groups within Myanmar that are fighting the central government. Um, he has few patrons and few allies, and so this has strengthened China's hand in some regard. But it has, um, it has chosen to use its position uh, in a few different ways. It sought to protect its infrastructure within the country, um, and so it has met with both sides to ask it, ask the NUG to instruct PDFs to protect infrastructure in Myanmar. And it has also asked the government to protect its assets in Myanmar, particularly the uh, two pipeline terminals at Madai Island in Rakhine State. Um, 
so I think Beijing will continue to watch uh, the direction of the conflict, and if past uh, actions are any are any guide, it will um, approach the conflict from uh, a position of uh, trying to maximize its self-interest. Um, if I could just briefly answer uh, Ms. Chu's question about you know resources, uh, this was a collaborative effort. We worked with an outside organization, ACLED, uh, that produced this data set. Um, and that has uh, Myanmar-speaking researchers and also ethnic language researchers uh, to try and understand and contextualize reports of violence from within Myanmar. And as you can see, there are around 13,000 that are captured in this map. So it was not a, not a small project on their part. And then we went through that data and made sure that we were comfortable with what it was showing. Um, and everything that you see on the map is something that the IISS has vetted as well. Uh, and then, of course, we had uh, Brody Smith uh, sitting beside me uh, whose uh, you know, tex technical expertise and Shona's deep uh, knowledge of Myanmar were able to put that in context and put that on a map like this. And so we hope to do more of these projects in the future. Uh, and we also hope to expand the map. We don't want this just to be uh, uh, something that you vis visit once. Um, we will continue to post analyses on the map, on the analysis page, uh, including the six commentaries of each warscape to come, but then also expand to other areas. So for instance, we can use the map to show displacement of people within Myanmar, where we have good data from the United, United Nations system, uh, or the, uh, the role of outside actors like China uh, in Myanmar. So uh, look for that in the third and fourth quarter of this year. Shona? Thank you, Ian, for the questions, and good to see you again as well. Um, there are so many ways to answer the question of what patterns of conflict look like in Myanmar. I suppose the first thing I can also say is that it is still early days to identify patterns as well. It has only been a bit more than a year since the coup, uh, but we can already see some patterns trying to, um, emerging. There are many ways I could answer this question, but I will focus on, I suppose, what came to mind first. The first thing is that Myanmar is currently heading into the rainy season. So the rainy season lasts approximately between May and October every year. And we already saw from last year that there was a bit of a lull in violence um, at this time. Uh, other analysts have also observed that the rainy season is um, the season in which anti-SAC forces in particular can take advantage and use that to regroup. So we might, maybe, um, you know, we'll keep watching the map and seeing how these patterns play out. We have also seen that right before the rainy season, the SAC has launched much more severe attacks um, on civilian infrastructure, as mentioned earlier, possibly as a way to combat um, um, as the SAC group's efforts to regroup during the monsoon. Secondly, we also see from the map, as mentioned earlier, a rise in infrastructure destruction um, throughout. These are the blue bars that you can see in the bar chart below. Uh, and we noticed that because of the raising of houses in the dry zone in the last few months, we see that this is becoming a much more um, important facet of the conflict in Myanmar, um, likely as a sign that the SEC's tactics have not been able to stamp out resistance forces so far. Thirdly, um, one aspect of the map that I find very useful that Mo also mentioned is the animation that shows how um, different um, kind of types of violence evolved uh, since July 2020. And we deliberately chose to start this map uh, before the coup so that you could see what the conflict in Rakhine looked like uh, before that and how that um, kind of ebbed away uh, after the November 2020 elections. But as you watch the map now, you can see how conflict in Rakhine is increasing, as well as in some other ethnic areas. And then, after the coup, a whole spate of green uh, dots come up, essentially, and this indicates crackdowns um, against, um, against protesters, primarily in large cities occurring all over the country. And then after that, you see kind of a widespread increase in um, attacks, as well as remote explosives, as people turn from nonviolent resistance to picking up arms. Fourthly, the other thing I will say is that when we look at our unattributed actors tab, there is actually a disproportionately high incidence of remote explosions. And of course, this makes sense because it's much harder to um, attribute remote explosions to someone. But we find this very, very intriguing, uh, looking at the distribution of these events um, and where they, um, where they are located. We notice especially that uh, remote explosions are prevalent uh, in Yangon and in the Irrawaddy Delta. Um, particularly in large cities where um, resistance forces have not yet been able to adapt to urban warfare. 
So I hope this demonstrates some of the trends that are emerging in Myanmar. It's by no means a comprehensive list. I'm sure that by using the map, there will be more to find out, more to analyze, and to look into. Thank you. Very good. So I, I said we were going to wrap up at the top of the hour. We might wrap up a couple of minutes early because you, you have places to go. But I take a couple more questions. So uh, I saw Amara Tiha. I see a question there. I don't know your name, I'm afraid. And I, I see one. Uh, uh, so yeah, there we go. So let's go to Amara first. I just want to question. Uh, hi, hi, my name is Amara. I'm from Myanmar. And I just want to question about how do you categorize the ethnic armed organization? Because in recent months, we have seen the trend that in some anti SAC forces are taking the EAO's route. That is, you know, they are considered as the Burman ethnic group or Burman ethnic armed organizations. And some are taking the uh, KYAR, PDF, are now taking a, a kind of EAOs. And they even sent a letter to the Northern Alliance, which usually consider as closer to China, to become the member of the Northern Alliance. And there's a two interesting question coming up is, how sh are we going to get the Gurais EAOs in the future? That we definitely sure that there will be more EAOs in the upcoming month. Uh, and another thing is, you know, when the KIA states, is, uh, KIA PDFs are asking to become the member of Northern Alliance, this mean they want to more or less want to close it to the Chinese and Chinese part. That will change a lot of secret dynamic, not only in Myanmar, but in the region, because that area is historically closer to Thailand and rely on the trade with the Thai uh, small arms system. So that's the question. Yeah. Thank you, Amara. Go to the, the back. Hi, this is uh, Niharika from the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if, in reading the data behind this map and in your broader assessment of the conflict, um, you've been able to come to some conclusion, even if it's temporary or moving, about the direction of the conflict. Uh, so there's been some debate and discussion recently about whether the anti-SAC forces um, have made significant headway or not, uh, whether they have developed into a force uh, to reckon with, and I'm wondering what your opinion is broadly on that question. Obviously, it's a com complex conflict, but to the extent that you can glean from the data here and other um, developments, it'd be uh, useful to know. Okay, and then one, one final question, and then I'm going to add one for myself just at the end. Hi. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Waki from CNA. Uh, I hope it's not too early to ask this question, but can I ask whether um, so far there's been any indication from any organizations or governments to potentially want to work with you to tap on the resources you've gathered for future policy making or their strategies? Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to abuse the chair's privilege, which is to ask Shona and Aaron if they might. I know that many of you here are not Myanmar experts. If you might um, close by just giving us a sense of where the diplomatic moment uh, around the Myanmar conflict has reached the ASEAN process and the, the other um, associated diplomacy into which evidence and data uh, of this sort might flow. Um, so that's four separate points on which to close. Um, Shona, maybe I could start with you and then let Aaron have the, the, the last word. So Shona, do you want to pick as many of those questions as you would like? Thank you again for the questions. Um, Amara, I will take your question uh, first. Uh, thank you. I think it's very interesting to see how definitions of EAO are also not static and they're shifting in the Myanmar context. When we were putting the map together, we of course had to come up with some kind of definition um, in order to make sense of the data. And what we eventually decided on was that EAOs would be, I suppose, known ethnic armed organizations that predate the coup. And anti-SAC forces would refer to new armed organizations uh, formed after the coup, with sporadic exceptions. So one perhaps significant exception there is ABSDF, which as you know is um, a signatory to the NCA, but is not often considered an ethnic organization. Um, however, that is really a small minority of the vast number of NTSAC forces that are included here. And in fact, we have a count of 934 anti-SAC forces recorded on the map, which is a huge number. That's it. To answer your question, um, what's also relevant, I think, is that in our map, you can toggle it to see actor groups involved. And what we were very aware of is also the collaboration between anti-SAC forces and ethnic armed organizations. So it is possible, um, as, as Brody has done right now, to see events in which both anti-SAC forces and ethnic armed organizations are involved. 
And these are instances where um, they have launched joint attacks, um, where they have subsumed themselves under EAO command structures and so on. Um, and of course, they are concentrated in Kenya and Kenya states. One thing we are watching out for in coming months um, is the consolidation of actors, as you say. How do actors portray themselves differently as the conflict wears on? Uh, but also, will they um, eventually kind of form alliances and combine with one another? Uh, besides kind of having alliance with the EAOs, uh, I'm also watching the way in which e, um, PDFs band together, especially in the dry zone, and to what extent they also band together with the NUG. That is something that will be reflected on the map, at least in the number of actors that are involved. And so we are also watching the number of new actors that come up every month as we look at the map. And I think from there we can get an indication of whether or not new PDFs are emerging, or whether or not they've decided to um, kind of combine their forces, and whether or not the conflict is becoming more organized than it was before. So yeah, thank you so much for the question. Just the, the, there was a question about uh, whether uh, or sort of anyone had been in, in touch about using the data. Maybe I can, I can take that question and then also answer Naharika's question uh, from the journal. Um, like it, no one's uh, asked us yet, but it it's, won't be live for another five minutes, so uh, <laughs> let's, let's wait and see. Uh, we, we do hope that this is a tool that governments can use to try and uh, explain perhaps to educated generalists who are not following the conflict day to day, as I know you do, uh, and as everyone who follows your Twitter feed uh, will, will know, uh, and that it renders some of that violence very quickly uh, in a framework that people can use uh, to explain it, and that that ultimately leads to uh, people wanting to find solutions to a conflict uh, or to uh, pursue diplomacy. And so that's, uh, that's the hope. Just to answer Naharika's question, if we could zoom in on the dry zone, I think when the People's Defensive War was declared by the NUG in September, uh, there were, you know, people speculated uh, that one, it was a little bit late, that actually there was quite a bit of this activity going on already. Many people in the dry zone didn't wait for the NUG to declare the People's Defensive War to start engaging in violent activity. Uh, but there was also a little bit of uh, uncertainty as to whether or not that declaration would cause violence to increase dramatically, and it did. Uh, and a number of new PDFs popped up after that period and have engaged in armed violence against the SAC. And then finally, there was some speculation that um, these PDFs might not last that many of them being sort of younger kids without a lot of military training, certainly not like the EAOs, um, that they wouldn't last very long, but they've been remarkably persistent. And in many parts of the dry zone, in rural areas, uh, PDFs continue to uh, engage in armed struggle. Uh, some would argue that they control areas of the dry zone. Again, we've chosen not to depict control um, because we think that's a slightly misleading metric. But um, the count, the, uh, the, the sort of the, the other side of this is that the SAC doesn't seem that alarmed by what they've seen in the dry zone. Uh, they don't have a lot of resource or infrastructure in the dry zone to beat back the PDFs in this area because they've not had to fight in this area for decades. Um, but rather than bringing in light infantry divisions to fight the PDFs in this area, they've decided to raise these Pusuati militias. Uh, and so they haven't moved their, their shock troops uh, that uh, became infamous during the violence in Rakhine State in 2017 uh, into this area. They have engaged in peace talks with some EAOs, which suggests that they're feeling some strain. Um, but uh, it's, it's not a conflict that leads one to any easy conclusion as to which direction the conflict is going or who's going to win or lose. Uh, I would say that the wet season, which is now upon us, um, will uh, provide an opportunity for PDFs to consolidate some of their gains. It'll be much harder for the SAC to maneuver during the wet season. So the situation may look different uh, differently after the, uh, the wet season passes. And I, I now want you to give us our precy very quickly to close on the, on the diplomatic situation. Right. Uh, well, you know, let's see what comes out of tomorrow's uh, special session on Myanmar. We have envoys from four countries the Foreign Minister of Malaysia, uh, the Special Envoy from Thailand, uh, Derek Chile, the Council of the State Department from the US. Uh, and we're looking forward to a conversation about uh, a way forward in Myanmar. I think uh, immediately after the crisis, there was a remarkable uh, 
unity of view within ASEAN and then also within the international community that the coup was illegitimate. So ASEAN used the, the phrase that they wanted a return to normalcy and everyone understood what that meant, um, that this was an unacceptable act by the, the SAC. Um, that was backed up by the UN Security Council with multiple presidential statements. There was actually a sort of unity of purpose within the international community that I think probably didn't get enough credit at the time. Uh, but that has begun to fracture. And although ASEAN was able to come together to determine that Minong Hlaing should not attend its meetings in October of last year, uh, it's going to be very difficult for ASEAN to maintain that unity as it confronts uh, other crises that will emerge from Myanmar in the future, whether it's humanitarian assistance uh, or the SAC's plan to hold elections. So uh, the international community, which continues to look to ASEAN to be in the lead on this particular crisis, uh, may have to begin to come up with some of its, uh, some of its own initiatives uh, because it is not clear that that ASEAN unity in addressing this crisis will be able to hold. Um, I'll stop there, but uh, I hope that uh, those of you who are interested would, will come to the special session tomorrow we'll, where we can discuss this further. Thank you. Let me say two things very briefly to close. The first is a note of thanks. Thanks to, to all three uh, of our presenters today. Um, also, this project was funded uh, in part by a grant from an organization called the IISS Friends in the United States, who are, who are donors to the organization who gave us a specific grant. So we're, we're very grateful for them. Um, the second, as I said before, this is not a standalone piece of work for the Institute. We, at, uh, at our core, study matters of military conflict. And, and so we have a couple of representatives from our Middle East office, um, Mio Hokayam and Tom Beckett, uh, who have been, for instance, studying the war in Syria. Uh, we're doing a lot of work at the moment uh, on Ukraine. You'll all have seen that tomorrow afternoon you can come to the island ballroom and, and see our special virtual message from President Zelensky. And Myanmar is the only active conflict uh, of any size and international geopolitical significance in Asia remains at the core of what we will be doing going forward. So, so many thanks to you all for coming. Uh, do go and have a look at the, Aaron, remind us of the address. It's myanmar.iiss.org. Very good. It's a very cool tool. Have a, have a play around with it. And, uh, and many thanks for coming. Thanks, everybody.